to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In our previous lecture, we discussed the period in which the French invaded and ultimately took over Vietnam, leading to French rule in the region by the 1890s. In this lecture and the ones to follow, we'll discuss the period of French rule itself in Indochina, leading to the period of American involvement in the 1950s. French colonization of Indochina, the region including Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, was not without controversy. Arguments in favor of French colonization included the fact that all great nations were engaged in the practice, and France would fall behind if they didn't. Acquiring Indochina also allowed France to compete directly with Great Britain, their chief rival. There was also an element of the restoration of French pride after their military defeat in Prussia in 1870. The natural resources of Vietnam promised new riches and markets for France. And finally, this quote-unquote civilizing mission, also referred to by some as the white man's burden, uh, to improve and Christianize uncivilized societies was a powerful motivation for some. And yet there were also strong arguments against colonization. One of them being that the efforts drained the French economy. We'll discuss this in much greater detail going forward because the thought was that colonies actually boosted one's economy. But in the case of Indochina, early on anyway, it drained the French economy. There were also many humanitarians who opposed the misery that was being imposed upon the Vietnamese and others around the world. Those arguing on behalf of the, quote, civilizing mission, or the white man's burden, uh, in fact made an argument that proved, for the most part, to be a mirage. The French, in fact, showed little interest in the development of Vietnamese political systems. They discouraged any sort of popular rule in Vietnam, and they squashed Vietnamese industries that might compete with their own. We're going to be discussing these kinds of issues in much greater detail over the slides to follow. The French encountered a problem with the early administration of the empire. Indochina wasn't making any money for France. In fact, it was costing France money to operate the empire and French citizens were taxed to pay for it, causing much dissatisfaction. The French government finally sent Paul Dumais to try to make the enterprise profitable. Dumais was the governor general of French Indochina from 1896 to 1902. Dumais' chief strategy for making the colonies profitable was to shift the cost of administration from France to the colonies themselves. He also attempted to modernize the economy and increase production. So here are some of the methods that Dumais employed. He imposed ruthless taxes on the Vietnamese and also installed high tariffs on imported goods. He created state-controlled businesses to sell licenses for the production and distribution of opium, alcohol, and salt. He created a great deal of infrastructure for more efficient manufacture and shipping of goods, including building bridges, railroads, and harbors. He also implemented a new land policy. He sold the best land to French colonists and some wealthy Vietnamese, and in general drove the peasants off the land, creating a mass of poor laborers. The thought being that if peasants were able to keep their own land, they would consume most of the crop being produced. In this way, the French made rice production much more efficient and export-oriented. Between 1880 and 1930, rice exports soared. Accompanying this was a forced labor system. These new landless workers were conscripted as workers, building railroads, working in the coal mines, and on rubber plantations. They toiled in terrible working conditions, and disease was rampant. In 
Dumay also encouraged the import of rubber trees and ultimately created hundreds of French-owned rubber plantations. So rice, rubber, and coal became the leading commodities in French Indochina, and Vietnam in particular. Coal was one of the leading commodities in the north, in Tonkin, and rice to the south in the Mekong Delta. Accompanying all of this, local business and industry was discouraged. All production became oriented towards enriching France. Raw latex harvested in Vietnam was then sent to France. There it was manufactured into tires and other products, and then sent back to Vietnam as products to be purchased at a great price increase. Dumay also worked to prevent foreign competitors. This was done by high tariffs and shipping costs. By 1939, only 5% of imports to Vietnam came from the United States. 55% came from France. All of these mechanisms inspired resentment among the Vietnamese. The vast majority of the population, over 90%, remained peasants and laborers under the French. Living standards declined, and by 1945, 62% of the peasantry owned less than one-ninth of an acre. Another 30% owned less than a quarter of an acre. The French divided Vietnam into three sections to rule, and you can see these divisions on the map on the right. Tonkin in the far north, around Hanoi and the Red River Delta. Anam in a long stretch of central Vietnam, around the traditional capital of Hue. And Cochin, China in the south, around the Mekong Delta. In Tonkin and Anam, the French opted for indirect rule, allowing Win leaders to rule as an extension of French rule. These regions were always somewhat peripheral to French interests. In Cochin, China, however, the focal point of the rich rice-growing regions, the French ruled directly and installed a very regimented structure. Citizens were forced to follow French laws and practices. French nationals who migrated to Vietnam typically settled in Cochin, China. Many settled in the Mekong Delta, where the marshlands were drained and huge plantations were established. Rubber plantations flourished along the border with Cambodia. And Saigon, the capital city, soon became known as the Paris of the Orient. Cochin, China soon became the richest French colony in Southeast Asia. Some Vietnamese in Cochin, China flourished under the French system. They were educated in French schools and adopted French cultural ways. Using their connections to the indigenous people, some of these Vietnamese acquired plantations of their own and became very wealthy. But these individuals often found their social status insecure. The French themselves frequently treated them with disdain. They were still, after all, uncivilized foreigners. And the Vietnamese people also scorned them as traitors. So while some Vietnamese accepted and flourished under French rule, there remained a great deal of ambivalence throughout the French colonial era. The Vietnamese resisted the French from the beginning of conquest and throughout French rule. Usually in small rebel bands, guerrilla warfare and hit and run tactics and small attacks, but occasionally with larger organized movements. The French set out to destroy all such resistance and discouraged Vietnamese nationalism. This contributed to mounting resentment, which ultimately led to an outright rebellion, which we'll discuss in future lectures. Some of the ways that the French encouraged this resentment included the fact that they referred to all the Vietnamese as Annamites, referring to the central region of Annam, and this became almost something of a slur. Vietnam, as noted, was divided into three regions for administration, Cochin, China, Annam, and Tonkin. Along with Cambodia and Laos, these were the five districts of the Indochinese Union, which was governed from Hanoi. 
Saigon was the cultural center, and Cochin China, as noted, was the economic core. The French appointed bureaucrats to govern, breaking traditional village autonomy. These were usually outsiders, and usually enacted harsh measures which were often corrupt. They were typically also Catholic converts. One French official said, On our side we have only Christians and crooks. The French refused to allow the indigenous population any significant role in the administration of this empire. They viewed the Vietnamese people as inferior, childlike, and useful only for labor. There were few opportunities for talented and educated Vietnamese, who often found their education left them with poor jobs anyway. At the University of Hanoi, a Vietnamese professor earned less money than a French janitor. Similarly, gifted Vietnamese students often went abroad for their education and returned only to find their aspirations frustrated. The French prohibited the use of traditional language in schools, enforcing the teaching of French. They also closed many Vietnamese schools and opened French alternative schools of their own. In 1907, when a nationalist group formed the Free School of Tonkin in Hanoi, the French arrested the teachers and closed the school. About 80%, therefore, of the Vietnamese population was illiterate. Prior to the French arrival, about 80% of the Vietnamese population was literate. As Ho Chi Minh said in 1920, French imperialism conquered our country with bayonets. Since then, we have not only been oppressed and exploited shamelessly, but also tortured and poisoned pitilessly. Prisons outnumber schools and are always overcrowded. Thousands of Vietnamese have been led to a slow death or massacred. In our next lecture, we'll talk about the Vietnamese resistance movement that mounted as a result of these many French actions.